Good afternoon, everybody. The uh, Digital Preservation Interest Group is uh, supposed to meet here. So uh, if that's where you expect to be, uh, you are in the right place. Uh, I am Jana Pinnick, the uh, current vice chair of uh, the IRMS. Um, and uh, the previous uh, part one was presented to you by Linda Shave, uh, the uh, chair of the group. Unfortunately, Linda has had to step down from chairing this group. Uh, so you'll get me instead for the uh, part two and part three. Um, at the same time, I would like to invite expressions of interest amongst you. Um, if you are interested in becoming the next group chair, please contact the group's director, Susie, or, or myself to discuss what that entails, uh, because uh, there's quite a big membership of this group and we would really love to keep it going. Um, so um, any interest, any ideas and any thoughts about that, contact one or, one or both of us even and uh, we'll take it from there. Um, so the slides I'm showing you today uh, were put together by Linda, so I shan't take credit for the content today. Um, so um, if the presenter is at fault, then that, that's my responsibility. The part two um, includes, um, the whole series is called Fundamentals of Digital Preservation. And this part two uh, is about the difference between digital archiving and digital preservation. Now, before I move on, um, just a few practical things. Um, at at, at the un, uh, uh, be, uh, underneath the uh, presentation, you have some icons on on the right hand side. So uh, there's hide sidebar if you wanted to uh, hide the chat and the list of people. But I invite you to use the chat function to um, ask your questions during the presentation and uh, we'll go through those um, at the end. And there is also um, an enter full screen mode if you wanted to have a larger version of, of the slides. Um, if there's some small print, that's a bit difficult to read otherwise. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to hide the chat myself. Um, Neil at the uh, event support will be monitoring uh, your questions in the chat and uh, alert me to those uh, at the end of the presentation. So the digital challenge, uh, first of all, um, I would like to um, note that uh, every organization, every sector, their digital challenges vary quite a lot. So um, there are different needs, different archiving processes in place. And uh, regardless of the context, uh, uh, this um, in new environment may be quite challenging if you have uh, not dealt with digital preservation before. Uh, this training, three-part training session, which uh, Linda developed for us, it is aimed at information and record managers and administrators, but also other information professionals and those uh, embarking on a new career in information and records management, uh, such as students doing masters. And uh, it will introduce you to the entire life cycle of records and the fundamentals in view of digital preservation. Um, and in personal experience, I've worked in um, information records management, but more currently in research data management um, and a bit in information governance. So the view uh, point of digital preservation is different in these roles than, for example, IT professionals or uh, digital or, or traditional archivists. So we may use the same language, but uh, still refer to slightly different things. And if you want to look a bit more into what these different um, differences mean in sectors and organizations, there's a, an excellent um, guide to this on the uh, Digital Preservation Coalition website. It is available to non-members as well. So I will share a, a link to it uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, the executive guide to digital preservation has a look at different organization types, what motivates the different types, um, what their particular risks and opportunities are, etc. So um, I will share a link to it at the end. 
and now I'm trying to change the slide. So um, here we go. It's all new to me. Um, so let's have a look at what the difference is then between digital archiving and digital preservation. And for the purposes of the presentation today, uh, we talk about digital archiving as uh, an activity which covers the identification, appraisal, description, metadata, all the way through to storage uh, management retrieval of digital records. And this um, activity includes all policies, guidelines and systems which are associated with all these processes so that um, we can maintain the integrity, both logical and physical, of uh, digital objects and records over time. It also covers, um, as records managers, you'll be pleased to hear, um, the spectrum of laws, policies, uh, procedures, governance and methodologies to address this whole of life issues of, of the uh, digital content that uh, we are maintaining. Whereas digital preservation usually refers to the formal task of ensuring that this, uh, di these digital objects or records, what, whatever they are, whether they are books, uh, artifacts, uh, digitized, born digital records of continuing value, remain findable, accessible, readable and usable. And the uh, continuing value here is an interesting um, expression because, again, uh, the uh, concept of uh, organizational differences of the previous um, slide, uh, they may have different um, opinions on what continuing value is. Is it five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years? Is it longer? So um, it's always uh, good to uh, do some research to your own content and what that means. And the, uh, uh, this task involves uh, different processes and operations which ensure both the technical and intellectual survival of the uh, authentic digital content through time. And it also includes environmental controls, security, creation of uh, content storage, handling and disaster planning uh, for uh, digital objects and records in um, all formats. And then um, we are also um, we can come across the expression digital perpetuation, um, and I sometimes use uh, the expression digital continuity. Um, digital preservation or, or um, perpetuation or continuity it doesn't happen by magic or by leaving things in in digital storage. You actually have to proactively manage or sorts of issues, uh, technology obsolescence being one of the probably most famous. And that would refer possi possibly uh, to file format migration. Uh, so um, Microsoft Office has gone through loads of different iterations. So that's one example of it. Uh, or even uh, the safer PDF has gone from 1.3 to 1.7 to PDF A. So you, you need to consider your file formats and um, if your older formats become obsolete you need to migrate them and also you need to protect uh, against bit rot which means uh, even if uh, your file um, is not obsolete and it's uh, stored safely it may by itself um, rot or become uh, un un inaccessible in which uh, the ones and zeros that form your uh, digital file become flipped so one and zero become zero and one and that means you can't open your file and you can't access it so it's uh, completely useless to you um, or um, in the uh, web environment we are all familiar with the following uh, web links or urls and those links uh, are, are broken and uh, make web pages or other resources um, on the web um, unfindable and unaccessible and there's been some research done to this, um, for example, um, I think it was biosciences or biology research papers within 10 years, 70% of the URL, URL links in papers have become broken, so uh, the research is then unavailable. Um, 
the, this digital perpetuation, it uh, rather than store, it's it's uh, more about transferring co digital content from one generation to the next. Whether we are talking about uh, user users of the content, the formats, software or hardware or technologies or others, and that generation again is an interesting um, concept because uh, we are not talking about the same as uh, generations of people. In digital world, uh, five years, ten years is an awfully long time. So uh, we just need to make sure that the content is handed over over that uh, that time. Data archiving, and then um, it is the activity which helps businesses meet compliance, and that's uh, storing data long term, and by consolidating data for easy access to other users. And this process is often or almost always automated using some sort of archiving software. It doesn't have to be, it may be manual and that makes it harder work. Um, but if you're using a software, the capabilities of, uh, of this software, they vary from one vendor to the next. Um, and most uh, software automatically moves your aging data. So you've set it up to do act actions, preservation actions, when um, certain criteria are fulfilled. And uh, that sort of forms your data archival policy. And archiving is more about storing st static data for future discovery. Um, whereas a data backup, which is more the IT talk, uh, that's uh, used to store changing data. So you take a backup copy at regular intervals to make sure that you don't lose your, your original content. Uh, the backups usually cover all of the business data, whereas uh, archives, uh, they uh, require appraisal. And uh, so you only store a certain subset of the data. The purpose of digital preservation and metadata. So um, preservation is concerned, as I mentioned before, with the process of ensuring that your digital resources, uh, whatever they uh, are for your organization, remain authentic and accessible over time. The focus of this activity is to provide long-term access and uh, preserve the uh, continued continuity uh, now and into the future. Um, so it's not just backup as well as I mentioned in the previous slide, but you need to consider all the other long-term factors which may change over time. Format, software, hardware obsolescence. How findable uh, do the uh, resources remain? How readable are they for users out there in different circumstances? and how reliable is both the content and accessibility. And, and there are many other issues to um, consider. Hang on, I went too far there, pardon me. Um, yes, there's the, uh, I didn't see that last on my uh, Screen. So um, digital preservation metadata, then uh, it includes uh, various types of metadata, which uh, you will be familiar from other, other contexts as well. So um, metadata is, of course, apart from data about data, it's uh, something you do require to manage and to search and preserve the uh, digital content. So you will, a uh, part of the preservation metadata is your descriptive or discovery metadata. What is what are the objects and how do you find them? How do you uh, signpost the way for users to get to your uh, digital content? The technical uh, metadata, for example, if you have uh, digital photos, technical metadata might um, denote uh, what sort of software uh, those uh, photos are stored in, what sort of hardware they were taken in, all sorts of uh, information about those digital photos. You may also have digital objects which are made of sev several parts. So you have structural software, which indicate the relationships with dif between different parts of your digital uh, content. So a um, website would have different parts. And uh, if you have to start storing uh, websites, you would need to um, capture all those relationships between 
the actual uh, programming language between uh, the images, uh, the text files, etc. An actual uh, digital preservation metadata then would capture information about actions that you have taken over time to uh, maintain the uh, continuity. Uh, for example, if you have had to migrate files from one format to another, if you have uh, created checksums, so that is sig file signatures to um, denote whether uh, anything within that file has changed uh, and re um, store those. Uh, and basically anything in the preservation uh, actions that uh, tell other users who has done what over time, what have they done, when did they do that, did that change that original uh, digital object in any way. So uh, those things are part of the metadata. Then let's have a look at something quite different, which is um, in some contexts it's called digital archaeology. You may also come across uh, digital forensics. For example, there is a section uh, in the uh, DPC Digital Preservation Handbook about digital forensics. So if you're interested in this, uh, you can. I'll, I'll share a link at the end again. And what that means is uh, if you have um, come across content um, where nothing you do um, will give you or other users access to that content anymore and you need to take some um, more drastic action to recover that. Um, you will need to usually spend quite a lot of uh, money and effort to uh, use tools and expertise um, and quite many organizations outsource this bit because uh, the uh, skill space is not quite, it's not very common in, uh, in normal uh, information and records management organizations. And um, it may be you have um, old tapes or cartridges which uh, you haven't got the hardware to uh, read anymore. Um, some sort of um, file formats which uh, you, you can't migrate to a new one. Um, and there are other uh, strategies and technologies like emulation, which we'll look into uh, on the next slide. But forensics, uh, when you hear about that, uh, then you need to start thinking about bud budgeting and how to uh, get to those content. Uh, then let's have a look at uh, four stages, or I might even call these four strategies of uh, preservation. So uh, a key issue for preserving digital content is uh, the challenge of ensuring that your objects remain accessible despite, despite the obsolescence of formats. And uh, four main strategies, and these are not the only ones, um, I'll also share a link to where you can find some more strategies, are listed here. So let's have a look at them. Migration, uh, which I've already used this word a couple of times here, so that is transferring your digital records from older, um, sometimes even obsolete hardware and software formats to current formats so that they remain accessible both to you and any other reusers of the records. Emulation, um, a bit more technical. Um, and that means uh, you're actually creating a software environment to recreate that original operating system to enable that original performance. Uh, and uh, you're using current modern computer systems to do that. So um, an example might be that um, you're emulating some 15, 20 year old computer games uh, which you play on, on a new um, laptop or a PC, but uh, you have created an environment which makes those games look like they did uh, when they were originally created. So the result is that uh, you're, you're preserving that original data format and accessing it in a new environment, but you don't need to change that original data. And it looks and feels the same as it did when it was first created. Perhaps uh, more um, regular for um, 
office environment and the traditional uh, digital archives is normalizing content when you take it in into your collections. So uh, you may receive and be offered a content in a number of formats and you don't want to um, in the long term maintain all of those different um, Word document formats or, or um, image formats and you decide you will only hold one or two of those formats so anything else you normalize and you um, it's sort of migration so you change that into say uh, all different uh, text files or word files you make them into pdfs so you are normalizing that um, and it you would then reduce the need to repeat migrations because then you're only maintaining one or maybe maybe two formats um, instead of um, several others. And rarest of these um, is something called encapsulation, which um, requires that you put together your digital object and your metadata and bundle them within a type of a, an envelope and you then um, preserve that envelope and um, keep that accessible. Not quite the same as zip files, but similar kind of thinking. So the metadata within that object then allows for the record to be understood and accessible uh, in different future technologies. And you would only need um, a viewer to um, display those records um, and that viewer would not interfere with the actual digital object. Um, about emulation, there's quite a lot of work being done um, by, um, if you went to Twitter and uh, found Ewan Cochrane, uh, he has been based at Yale University in the US. He's done a lot of work in emulation and they are, uh, I think, creating a, a whole registry of uh, different formats that uh, have requirements to be emulated. So um, people have been feeding into that uh, work outside the Yale University as well. Um, when, when we started, I said that different roles have different uh, perspectives into digital preservation. So even when we use the same word, um, we may refer to slightly different thing. So uh, what Linda collected here for us is to have a look at certain key concepts um, in digital preservation and digital continuity. Uh, from particularly records and information management point of view. So we can um, compare our current work environment and to see if, uh, if we need to make any mental adjustments to uh, these uh, terms. So I think authenticity is um, pretty much uh, the same for records managers. Something is what it purports to be. Uh, so um, whatever is being cited is the same as it when it was first created, unless that uh, preservation metadata has captured some changes made to that object. Um, now the one proviso I would say is, whereas in analog records um, you only have one original, in digital world you may have several objects that look exactly the same, including the metadata. You can copy it easily. So um, we could have another webinar about uh, how to ensure the uh, that, that we have an original piece of digital work. Now, how do we know that's the case? For digital, um, that's something that hasn't ever had an analog equivalent or it's not even possible, um, say, digital databases, for example, you may put details about analog content into your database, but um, when you print that database out, it's no longer something you can um, update as easily. It's not something where you can find those relationships between different objects. So um, it's, it's a born digital record. Uh, whereas digitized, digitized material, uh, which um, is, is there in the same expression, that is something that did exist uh, as a paper copy or, or something that we took a photo of, and uh, the original will always be an analog. And you may uh, then digitize it to make it more accessible and whilst preserving that uh, analog copy. 
um, we've already covered the digital object. So that is um, a group of um, items that uh, make up one digital um, object or content. Um, so there is some sort of um, relationship between the uh, parts and maybe a wrapper to bind them together. Uh, preservation, we started from this so that the, all the series of activities, pro processes and policies, uh, so there's an awful lot to go into that it's not just technical preservation, so it's a, as much if not more about people and how to do things and why to do things. Digitization, that was the uh, creating a, a digital um, version of an object. Digitized, um, same thing, I think. The disk image, that's uh, to do with uh, ensuring when you have um, a digital copy that you need to retrieve from, say, a hard drive. Uh, and that in that process of copying it, you don't change the metadata, for example, the creation date of that item. So um, in, uh, this image is that process of um, copying the entire contents without uh, changing any of the metadata. Um, for example, if you um, attach uh, a file into an email and the recipient stores that attachment on, in their system, then the creation date will be different from what it shows in your system because it, it doesn't transfer. Um, we had a look at the encapsulation, so um, that the goal of that is to keep the data and the operating system bundled together so that uh, you can then use that viewer uh, technology to um, get to the information. Emulation, uh, we looked at this as well, so uh, how to um, overcome technological obsolescence uh, by using techniques for imitating that initial original system on contemporary generations of computers. File format migration is, I think, one that most of you will be familiar with uh, converting files into other formats, which are more be better supported and rendered or viewed. Um, interesting, um, this, this um, taking um, digital objects into a managed environment, uh, I think that's familiar to most of you especially in the uh, data management world, we have a uh, whole in ingestion teams working on, on this. Long term, I already said we can't really, I'm sure, agree what is long term. What is long term for you may not be long term for me. I work in my day job with the geological data. So uh, if we have content uh, about uh, millions of year old fossils, that uh, content is still usable maybe another million years from now, whereas in some contexts, long term may be much, much shorter. Um, preservation, um, that was the uh, maintaining the understandable information and records. Metadata, we did look at that as well and the different types of metadata. So we looked at descriptive technical rights metadata as well. Um, most uh, records managers uh, are quite right in uh, um, emphasizing the uh, importance of rights metadata. Uh, who, What content are you al allowed to store? What are you allowed to share? Um, and with, with whom? Provenance as well. Um, where, did, where did the content come from? Uh, so if you need to approve the uh, authenticity um, and reliability that you are able to go back and say where that record came from. Um, migration, we've talked about that. So here, example, migrating a doc file into a PDF. And uh, we could have a discussion about the different types of PDFs as well, another time maybe. We've looked at normalization, so uh, selecting a subset of file formats that you want to be supporting in the long term and minimizing the uh, number of formats um, managed by your organization and also uh, minimizing the cost relating to that. 
and preservation metadata covers all those other types of metadata and it supports and records um, digital preservation processes in the context um, of a project for example it's an umbrella term which refers to the other um, subsets of metadata and some of the links here um, i will share the slides with you as well after the talk so uh, you will get, get all this uh, these links um, etc so what i'm doing now is i'm just having a look here um, so um, this was the part to, we will have a look at what questions you have and I will stay here as long as you have some questions. Um, next, in next part, so that will be part three, uh, it'll get more hands-on. So today we had a look at um, the uh, vocabulary and the terms and what, what does this mean in terms of um, differences between information and record management on one hand and digital preservation on the other. But next time we'll look at how to actually initiate a digital preservation project. And again, um, I would not call it a project because that means that you do something and then it's all finished and done and dusted and you don't need to worry about it anymore. Digital preservation is something that is an ongoing activity if you are uh, to maintain um, your digital content in the long term. We will look at how to write and start implementing a digital preservation policy and look at some preservation tools um, and this is something that I have actually done in my day job. Um, I first explored the uh, requirements of our uh, data center, then spoke to the um, first the staff, but also the data generators, looked at the uh, requirements from both sides, uh, drafted a policy, ran it past the uh, senior management team. And uh, then we did a data survey where, where we uh, looked into well a bit more in depth into um, what's actually happening on, on the ground how do people manage their digital content what could they do better and I'm now in a um, process of training a new digital preservation team and training them to look at different aspects like metadata like creating checksums at the ingestion uh, learning about tools and uh, all that sort of things. So uh, we will look at that kind of um, work in part three. I'm going to stop hopefully sharing the slides now. Okay, I might have pressed the wrong Right, I'm showing the sidebar now and I can move that, confirm, okay. And let's go. Oh, thank, thank you, Cecily, that's very kind of you. Um, I was expecting a long list of questions there. So uh, if you had any questions um, from those slides or anything I set on top of the slides, um, now is your chance to uh, ask those questions. Um, whilst I'm waiting, I can tell you a little, little bit more um, about the context in which uh, I'm doing this work. So uh, I did um, my, my degree in information records management at Northumbria University, but my day job really required me to work on digital preservation. So I very soon moved to learn more about that and I did um, a postgraduate module at Aberystwyth University, and I can recommend that. If you have access to a DPC as a member, that's a good uh, place to go and have a look as well how to get started. Uh, a lot of their content is available to non-members, so there, there's a lot there. Um, what I'm going to do next is share those links that uh, I agreed in the beginning I would uh, send to you. So first of all, the um, executive guide to digital preservation where you can have a look at different requirements within different sectors and organizations so 
um, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, the link is now in the chat. The slide which talked about different digital preservation strategies, uh, including emulation, migration, etc. It comes from um, the next link. So there is um, um, a whole set of pages about uh, digital preservation, not only strategies. So that's where the link takes you to. But there is an awful lot of other content, um, also including terms and concepts more about uh, obsolescence, uh, physical threats to your content, etc. So that's a very, very good place to go and um, study a bit more. And last but not least, if you have quite old content that uh, you are worried about, um, there's more about digital forensics um, in the next link on the uh, DPC um, Digital Preservation Handbook. I think. You can all access those now. Okay, any questions from any of the audience? It may be that I haven't even covered all the terms because uh, this is quite uh, a big um, landscape in digital preservation. It, you can't to do digital preservation as one individual in isolation. You have to work together with an awful lot of other roles and uh, experts. So um, communication skills are very important in this and trying to build that mutual understanding of where we are coming from with our content and uh, say regulatory background uh, how to talk to it in fact there's a good paper out there on, on online somewhere about how to talk to it about digital preservation um, but also how to talk to senior managers to get the resources to do this work and why it's important um, and again in the um executive uh, guide to digital preservation, you will find content about um, building a business case and how to communicate the need for this work to your senior managers who hold the purse strings. <laughs> uh, what works in raising awareness? Again, I, I can recommend um, well, first of all, I know I'm repeating myself in talking about the DPC materials, but they have done an awful lot of work about raising awareness. Um, and they are also very good on, um, let me just see if I can find it here. Um, da -da -da. So on the executive handbook, uh, there there is a section about there's facts and figures and also templates um, so you can um, produce a um, letter to executives using the, the kind of um, language that uh, is relevant to your sector or your organization explaining to them uh, why this uh, needs to be d done um, and personally uh, working um, at a research organization where uh, our scientists are much more interested in uh, do, getting on with their science rather than manage, even managing their data. So we've had to go a step back, look at how they manage their data so that it's named properly, it's versioned properly, it's stored properly. Um, and then that the next steps, we actually capture it to our collections so we can manage it. So you need to talk to, uh, if you can, uh, the people who generate and, and the data and if you can help them to do that in a way that then supports your work. And uh, I noticed, uh, Stephanie, there, um, you've got more a bit more of an archivist background than me uh, and I confess I'm not an archivist at all. Um, so you need to talk to all the other functions as well to see how you can collaborate because you are all trying to achieve the same objective which is you, you want to uh, capture good quality robust data in the long term and you all have a different role in making that happen. 
So, uh, but you also don't want to be duplicating the work. So if somebody else is doing one thing towards that goal, then you are doing something else. Um, so just make sure that uh, you built your digital preservation jigsaw for your organization so that it is as complex, uh, as complete as possible. And uh, yes, there are uh, accredited archives uh, services. There are also uh, accredited uh, data centers. So for example, we are under a core trust seal certification. So all these uh, different sector accreditations, um, they contribute to your um, quality of, of your archives in the long term. Make sure you have uh, the right processes in place um, and you have um, a continuing improvement plan as well in place. So it may be intimidating if you look at some big organizations um, uh, who have been doing this a long time and you are a small organization with less resources. What do you do to start doing it? Well, anything is better than nothing. Small steps are more important than spending an awful lot of money to buy a system which nobody is, is able to use or will not use because it's too much change management and you haven't got resources to manage that work. But um, just look at what is happening now in your organization, where you want to get to and all those little steps that you can already take to start moving towards that uh, new goal. And like I said, uh, next time when we look at the uh, developing your uh, policy and uh, developing your digital preservation, let's call it a program, I call it a program, um, we can then uh, look at that. Um, I think Deal and I were talking about organizing the uh, next uh, webinar in September. Uh, I'm saying that because July and August are holiday season and many of you are away and uh, we would like to make this uh, next part available to as many um, members as possible and I'm away the last uh, couple of weeks in August myself. But in the meantime let's get back to what I said in the beginning. So we are now short of a group chair and um, if any of you would be interested in that role I'm inviting you to approach uh, either a uh, group's director, Susie Taylor, or myself. Uh, Susie knows all about uh, the, all the technicalities about uh, being a group chair and what it entails. Um, and uh, I'm here if you want to talk about the actual digital preservation content and uh, your, your plans for it. So we are both happy to um, answer any queries you have. Any other questions? Or oh, have I missed any questions? Yes, you will get uh, slides. Did I already mention that? So I will I will share those with you. Hopefully a recording too, if it's worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, the slides will be um, in, your, in your email. I think Neil will help me find uh, the a list of uh, people who attended, so. I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's wait for a bit in case there's some other comments or questions. Uh, and in any case, uh, we'll we'll see you all, or you'll see me in any way in in September when we do the uh, third part of this series. Um, so DPC, you need to apply for a corporate membership. I don't know with. Um, they only do corporate membership, so there's no such thing as an individual membership I'm afraid um, but uh, as I said a, an awful lot of their content on the website is um, made available to non-members as well and that's one of the reasons why uh, we initiated this group um, because um, we realized that not all organizations um, are members of DPC or other preservation organizations like Open Preservation Foundation is another one. Um, there's Digital Curation Center for more researchy type of content. Um, so um, if these avenues 
are close to you. Um, please keep coming to these meetings and uh, share your requirements and your needs and uh, your struggles in preserving your digital records and content. And uh, the IRMS will be there to support you as much as we can. And also, it's also sharing with your peers here. So some of some of the members are further with the work. If you're working in archives, for example, you have done more work on this. But if you are a small commercial organization or local authority, you may not have a digital preservation team or an expert. So uh, do come along and uh, tell us about what you need. And I um, I can raise them up in other contexts as well. So IRMS definitely, but also in other places. And uh, we can start building uh, some more networks with uh, digital preservation experts outside the IRMS. I can't see any more questions coming. So uh, I thank you all for attending today. It's been great to see so many of you here today. Thank you for your comments and questions. And uh, we'll uh, draw for a, uh, we'll advertise the uh, date for the part three, but expect it to be in the first half in September. And uh, I'll uh, look forward to uh, having you all here. And uh, after that, uh, I hope we'll find a, a new chair for the group um, and uh, we'll keep this communication open between those of us who are interested in the topic. Thank you all. Thanks, Jana.